This is another exclusive rock music star interview. Conducted by Thomas S. Orwalk Jr. Welcome to episode number 27 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwalk Jr. It's June 29th, 2021. And my guest today is Ronnie O'Quinn, the bass player of the legendary classic rock band Foghat. In addition to Rodney, Foghat currently consists of original drummer Roger Earl, plus Charlie Hune on vocals and guitar, and Brian Bassett on guitar. Rodney joined Foghat in 2015 on the recommendation of original Foghat bass player Craig McGregor. This year, Foghat will be celebrating their 50th anniversary and to commemorate, they will be releasing a CD DVD set entitled Eight Days on the Road on July 16th. This set has many of the band's classic hits and was recorded on November 17th, 2019 at Daryl's House Club. Before joining Foghat, Ronnie played in the Pat Travers Band from 2007 to 2015 and was also the manager of the band. He was the co-producer of the Guitar Gods of the 70s tour in 2010, which featured Pat Travers, Mark Farner, Ronnie Montrose, and Derek St. Holmes. We talk about this and much, much more in the following exclusive interview. So get ready. Here he is, Rodney O'Quinn. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode number 27 of the Rock Interview Series. And today we have a great special for you. We have none other than Rodney O'Quinn, the bass player of the legendary band Foghat as our guest. Rodney, how are you doing today? Excellent, excellent. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're in the, in the beginning of my favorite week of the year, the 4th of July week. And one of the things I love doing this week is, uh, you know, going outside and cranking up music. And I can't think of any better band than cr- to crank up than Fog Hats. So I well, decided. You obviously, it's got to be like your favorite uh, week leading up because I see back there in the corner, you got some Gene Simmons going on and, you know, he likes to blow stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. And that might be the reason. I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, Kissing the Fourth of July is good, too. But um, the classic Foghat song, Slow Ride, um, I Just Want to Make Love to You. I mean, great songs, great summer songs. And uh, you uh, you guys are going to be releasing a brand new uh, CD, DVD set called Eight Days on the Road uh, on July 16th. And this kind of commemorates like a 50 year anniversary of the band. Yes, yes. It's the 50th anniversary since the release of the first record. And uh, actually, the first record had I Just Want to Make Love to You on it. Um, But yeah, we recorded this uh, pre-pandemic at uh, live at Daryl's house. It's up in Connecticut, same place he films the uh, TV shows, but they also have it where they'll uh, bring uh, crowds in. It's almost like a, a dinner concert type environment intimate crowd it's only like maybe about 180 people max but uh, uh but this place is like full pro tools uh, recording setup and then it was a nine or 11 camera video shoot all done in so it was all in house it was very very nice and it's a great sounding room yeah absolutely um and 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 Foghat usually doesn't play in in front of such an intimate audience. So what was that experience like for you playing in front of just like a, a hundred people or so? It was very, but it was very intimate, very personal, you know? Um, so it was, it was a, it was a very nice experience because, you know, people were like just right there and then you could have your time, your little story time in between songs and a uh, uh, very low pressure. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was enjoyable. One of the things with Foghat, since you have such a history, is uh, it must be difficult to kind of come up with a set list. Do you find that challenging? Well, I mean, Foghat definitely is not known for short songs. It seems like every song is a bare minimum five minutes. (laughs) Some songs like uh, Slow Ride and I Just Want to Make Love to You live ends up running more between seven and nine. So knowing that you definitely have to play Fool for the City slow ride um i just want to make love to you and stone blue those four songs right there uh every now and then if we do do a show where where it's just like a 45 minute set that almost kills the 45 minutes right there in four songs (laughs) so those are the the songs you have to play so by time uh you get through some of those 
uh, it, it, then it, it doesn't give you as much room to go, well, I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that, you know? So really don't get the opportunity to play as much different songs as we would like to. So, but we try to change it up each year. So, you know, you have the ringers that you know you have to have, but every year we change the others. Uh, Ronnie, you've been with the band since uh, uh, 2015. Uh, what, what was your first gig with Foghat and how was that for you? This year, the very first show, oh, you would ask me, I don't even remember exactly where the first show was. Uh, it was a really, I mean, backstory and just a little bit on that. Um, I was playing with Pat Travers. I had played with Pat Travers from 07, actually up to 16. So I actually did um a year where i did double duty between fog hat and pat travers um but i uh remember meeting and talking with craig mcgregor and uh it came to the point that he finally after we were uh talking he just finally said look i'm thinking about uh you know retiring and uh, i want you to take my place i'm like wow so Fast forward, you know, a couple of months later, I came out and started playing for him. I don't remember the first show, but I remember it was super cool being on stage with him. But it was really surreal because actually the tour manager and a few other people kept telling me that, you know, I needed to come play with them because Craig was starting to take time off here and there because he was managing his son's band. And they kept saying, you need to come play. You need to come play. And then it just all happened. So... Uh, joined Pat Travers in 2007, correct? Correct. Yeah. And before that, you were retired uh, from the music industry. I was a normal guy. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, I got off the road really back in like 97, I think. And I just kind of, uh, you know, at that point, I just played, you know, club bands and stuff. Uh, but I was with some very big, successful club bands. And uh, I played a lot. From 84 till 97, I played a lot. Then I just, I didn't want to do it no more. And I uh, became a normal guy. Then I slowly got back into playing on weekends. And my whole thing, I didn't tell bands. I don't rehearse. And, you know, two, three times a month is plenty. But uh, I was in the window and door business. But I could see the writing on the wall about the real estate bubble going to bust. And then the Pat Travers thing came available. I said, you know, I might need to go do this to have an egg in another basket. And lo and behold, it was a great call because the bubble busted. I got laid off from the window and door business, but I kept making money and rocking and rolling. And actually, where I told myself I would do it a year, two years tops, I'm still doing it. And it's actually I'm where I was meant to be all along. So yeah. I guess when the retirement i was fighting what i was truly meant to be doing <laughs> what, what was that experience like playing uh, with pat travers one of the one of the most amazing guitar players in my opinion on the face of the earth uh it was great i was a huge travers fan still am still a huge trap you know fan of the music love the music um it was very surreal and great you know playing with him and uh I played with them in a time where uh, Sandy Gennaro that played with them, like Sandy Gennaro came in on drums after Tommy Aldridge back in the eighties. So Sandy played on the uh, radioactive and black Pearl records. And then, you know, I saw Pat back then. And then you fast forward, you know, out of all the years I played with Pat, me, Sandy, a guitar player named Kirk McKim, which was the second guitar player and Pat, we were like a solid lineup for five of those years, five of the eight and a half years I was with Pat. Mm -hmm. We was just the four of us. And it was, uh, it was pretty powerful. It, it was, it was a great lineup and, and uh, just everybody complimented everybody. Yeah. And, so, and you, you recorded a studio record with Pat. I did actually two studio records with Pat and two live records. Mm -hmm. so, and, and what was it like um, working on those studio records? Um, the first one, we went up into Canada and uh, this guy had, you know, had built a studio out in the middle of nowhere in this cottage right on this lake. And uh, we went up there for a couple of weeks and we worked with a producer, Steve Thompson, which is a, a Grammy award winning producer. 
Uh, and uh, it, it was pretty cool being locked up in the woods doing that. But it was also one of those situations, anything that could go wrong went wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, whether you're in the middle of nowhere and the SSL console got struck by lightning and you had to order a power supply that, you know, uh, you, you had trouble getting it through customs and all sorts of stuff. And um, it, it just seemed like anything and everything that could go wrong during that time did. But yeah. we actually got a really, really uh, great sounding CD. Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, wasn't there like issues with distribution on that CD? Where yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't released right away and it took a while. Or Yep. Yep. I, I had to do a lot of work behind the scenes to finally help get that release release because I used to handle Pat's business. That was another thing when I got in the band. I finally, it's like, you need someone handling your business. So that's what I did. But um, I ended up having to make amends between Pat and uh, the guy that had Alexis Records. And finally, after some delays, we got it released. But the one thing that this guy just didn't know, he was basically a guy that had a lot of money. And I'm gonna, I, I'll start a record label. But, you know he didn't have any distribution in place or anything. So really distribution was minimal. Other than that, we just sold everything at shows and, and online. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, other things that um, you were responsible for um, was you put together this uh, a great uh, festival called uh, Guitar Gods of the 70s. Yes, yes. Me and a uh, uh, agent in uh, Kansas City. Yeah, in Kansas City, Frank Moyer with AME Entertainment. Uh, me and him would talk. He booked a lot of dates for us, and we finally started kicking the can around of this ideal. And it, it packaged where it, it, it limited the amount of uh, equipment and, and, and overall expenses because you had one core band, which was me, Sandy, and Kirk, that we played behind uh, Derek St. Holmes, Mark Farner, uh, the late Ronnie Montrose, and, of course, Pat Travers. So we could sell this in, to uh, festivals and, you know, we played the Rib America Fest. They were big back then. We played um, just about all those and bike rallies and stuff. And you could basically sell the one package and have your full day worth of entertainment. So, but uh, yeah, that was a really cool experience. Made for a long day, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, those are some of my favorite guitar players of all time. I'm, I'm kind of mad that you didn't bring that to Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so so, we, so let's uh, talk a little bit about some of those guitar players so when, when you uh, went on that tour tell us a little bit about Ronnie Montrose what were some of the things that um, some of the experiences you had with him man I love Ronnie Montrose God rest his soul when we were first putting it together Mark Farner was the easiest to deal with every time you got Ronnie Montrose on the phone it was like there was always something and it was like oh this guy's going to be so difficult so difficult when we actually got together, we only had, before our first show, we only had like slated an hour and a half rehearsal time with each artist the day before. And when we first met up with Ronnie, all of a sudden that was a complete 180. And Ronnie was just such a sweetheart and such a uh, laid back and easy guy to deal with. But I'll never forget, and I say it all the time, before we played note one, he just looked at us. He says, I just want you guys to know there's no such thing as mistakes, just new opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Okay. But and he, was, he was such a pleasure to hang out with and everything. And we were actually, I was in the process of uh, booking a, a run of dates where it was just going to be Pat and Ronnie. And, uh, I remember talking on the phone with Ronnie about a week and a half before, uh, you know, he died oh, and wow. he was looking forward to going. So then a week and a half later, when I get the phone call, I was just devastated. I, I just did not see that coming. Wow. That, what, yeah. a, what a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, you know, apparently, uh, you know, Ronnie was a prostate cancer yeah, prostate cancer survivor. And I know at times he would talk to me and his whole thing was, is he would never go through all that again. And I never got the official word, but I knew he was going to the doctor sometime around there for like a follow-up. And that's the only thing I can think is that maybe he had gotten bad news again. And 
another thing that threw me off was, you know, apparently when Ronnie was on the road, you know, he might have one glass of wine. That was it. You know, apparently he had his, a dark side too that I never saw because the Ronnie I knew was like, just, you know, wouldn't harm a butterfly, you know? So it kind of really threw me off balance when the whole thing went down. Wow. Yeah, that, that's terrible. But I still uh, still have a lot of connection with his wife, Lisa. She she comes out to whenever we're out in the West Coast. She comes and sees us, and uh, she's a complete sweetheart. And uh, she she's definitely like a rock. Mm -hmm. She's uh, holding in there really good. Mm -hmm. I see. What what about uh perform with Mark Farner? I mean, can't really say enough about what he's contrib his contribution to rock music. I mean, he's really. <laughs> This guitar yeah. playing is so innovative. So what was it like playing with someone like him every night? You know, I, I, that was the thing. I was, a, you know, I loved Graham Funk growing up, but I didn't realize, of course, we didn't have the internet back then. I didn't realize the magnitude of how big they really were back in the day. I mean, uh, I mean come on, selling out Shea Stadium faster than the Beatles, yeah. you know, and some of, some of the other things they did they did these enormous you know uh, events you know and i mean they were just they were unstoppable just a machine um uh, yeah, he was a real pleasure to play with you know i mean and and he definitely he's got an aura about him you know and he gets on stage in his little peacock strut and everything <laughs> so yeah. uh but yeah the songs it was just it was just it was great playing with all those guys because just the catalog of songs you could play it was just amazing yeah it must have been a night of non-stop hits yeah 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 because that was the thing too we kept everyone to 45 minutes so mm. that is mandatory we're going to play the hits and get you off yeah. so it's just totally cool to be able to you know hit after hit after hit you know and then one of the other artists was Derek St. Holmes. What was the experience yeah. working with him? I mean, he he was the voice of Ted Nugent, you know, back in the uh, mid '70s, singing yeah. on a lot of his hits. Yep, yep, yep. No, it was very cool playing with Derek. Um, Derek didn't do all the dates with us because about the time we started doing this, he had committed to all these shows, but then all of a sudden he went back out with Ted. And uh, he didn't see it coming. We didn't see it coming. So he did uh, the first, I think he did like the first four or five with us. And then he dropped off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was just, it was just super cool playing those things. And Derek's such a, you know, such an amazing guitar player. Yeah. He, he, he's definitely a solid player and boy, does he still got a set of pipes. Yeah. And, and ironically uh, his replacement in Ted Nugent band, Charlie Hewn is in fog hat. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Charlie sang for Ted. That was kind of crazy because, you know, like I said, once again, back then we didn't have the Internet. We had no access of anything. By the time Double Live Gonzo actually hit the record stores, that band, that lineup was already gone. You know, at that point, Charlie was already in singing. Now, I take that back. I think I think the drummer, Clive Davies, was still there. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, but I think at that point, Dave Cosweeney was playing bass, but, uh, but yeah, I remember Charlie telling me yeah, by the time double on Gonzo hit the record stores, he was already singing for the band, yeah. but uh, he put the band like 78 to 82. Right. So yeah, yeah it's kind of like a cool thing when I, when I grew up learning how to play, cause I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the kid in the band. <laughs> That's the joke. Here I am at 55 and I'm the kid. <laughs> yeah, you're 55 but, and they're going on their, they're on their 50 year anniversary tour. So right. Yeah. You, you, you really you really can't convince anyone, I don't think, that you were there from day one. Well, that's a whole nother story. I'll get that in a minute. <laughs> um when I first started playing, I was eleven. Fog Out Live had just came out, and a friend of mine had turned me on to it. So back then there was a lot of live albums out. So I'm like learning how to play bass to these live records. So you got it cranked up in your room and you got the audience noise and everything. And there were certain people I would play to the songs. And in my head, I go, I could play with these guys. I could play with these guys, you know? And uh, my whole thing is I look back in life. Okay. I played with Pat Travers, go for what you know, came out. I learned a lot of that stuff. I ended up playing with Pat Travers. I never directly played with Ted, but I know Ted now through everybody, but I've played with both the Ted singers. 
Uh, but I was diehard. I could play with fog hat. I could play with fog hat, you know, and here I am, you wow. know, and so that, that's just a great thing. Now, the other part of that story is like you said, you know, people's not really buying it. I do remember early on one of my gigs, I come out right to the edge of the stage. I get in that rock and roll stance and I see this guy down in front of me and he's pointing at me and he's like hitting his wife and then pointing at me and stuff and after the show and our meet and greet he comes up to me and his whole thing was he goes i told my wife as soon as you came out the edge of the stage and you got that stance i kept saying that's him that's him i remember seeing him in 1978 (laughs) wow (laughs) the thing is there's a lot of people you can't convince them one way or another you just like yeah (laughs) but there's a lot of people you know that they're really to them they know you're you know not the the original stuff but they're thankful that you know you're helping be a part of it yeah and and a big honor to me is i was a huge craig mcgregor fan for craig mcgregor out of this whole story to actually hand pick me to be a successor is an extreme honor and it, to me, it's something I don't take lightly. It's something every time I get on stage, I have my little conversation with Craig before I go on, you know, uh, it's a very surreal thing to me. I mean, there are bands out there without any original members. Yeah, I was just getting the update from somebody uh, that, uh, that saw Blackfoot this past weekend. Mm-hmm. You know, and here's my thing. Roger's been consistent since day one, Roger. You know, and it, you hate it that it's, it, you, it's to, well, you can't say hate it. That's the wrong choice of words. But you would like to think maybe, you know, it, you, the person was still the voice, you know, would be there. But, you know, I mean, uh, but Roger's been the consistent force in the band the whole, the whole time. Because even at one point, I mean, and I think about 84, Lonesome Dave Pepper said he didn't want to do it no more, and he went back to England. So after a while, Roger's like, oh, I'm going to keep playing, you know? And then in, uh, I think it was like 10 years later, I guess I think like 94-ish, Rick Rubin wanted to get the original band back together. And, uh, and then it all kind of came back together, and they did it for a while. And then unfortunately, it wasn't too long after that, you know, Dave had the pancreatic cancer and passed away. But I think it's really neat that, you know, and I, my whole thoughts and feelings are if Charlie was like the third singer after Dave, it wouldn't have credibility. But I mean, since Lonesome Dave passed away, you know, which Roger and Lonesome Dave had saw Charlie when he was singing for Humble Pie. And that was their thing. Who's singing Steve Marriott's parts? And they were really impressed by him. So when Roger had to think about it, he was like, let me call. Let me see if I can get a hold of Charlie. And at that point, Charlie's been the only singer since. So he's been in the band now 20, 21 years. Yeah. Um, you know, Brian Bassett, he, uh, he's been involved with Fog Hat. He was originally playing with Lonesome Dave's version of Fog Hat. And then when they all got together, he was out. He went to Molly Hatchet. And then when Rod Price couldn't tour no more, he came back in. But collectively, you know, Brian's 25, 26 years that he's been with Fog Hat. So it's very consistent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's hard to believe, you know, how much time's already passed now that I'm here. Um, but uh, everybody is really honored for what they're getting to do. Yeah, it'd be great if it was the original lineup. But I mean, the only band I know out there that's the original lineup is Easy Top. <laughs> you know they're the only ones i could even think of where it's the original lineup you know and there's a lot of haters i have to stay off the reading the youtube comments at times because you got the people that just you know they hate the fact you know oh it you know when lonesome dave or rod price was not fog hat whatever but it's like you know what you need to enjoy it while you can because there's a lot of stuff that's fixing to come to an end there's a whole generation of music that is almost to the ending point, you know, that, that you won't have any inkling to be able to see, see it no more. 
Yeah, so. that, that's always my argument on it is like, you know, there's these these are classic songs. I mean, wh why would you not want to hear them anymore? I mean, as long right. as you have quality musicians who are dedicated to doing it. I mean, like you said, it, it is going to I mean, a few years, there's going to be a, really not many original bands at all from like the classic rock era or anybody that's even recognizable, you know, yeah. at that point. So, you know, there's no reason why the band's legacy should like die out like that i mean they're great songs well the one thing i have a, I would say i have a problem with when you have bands with uh replacement guys is when you have bands when there's uh there ends up like not being no legacy to the placement players it's like you, you might see a guy this time and then a year later you want to go see him and there's completely different people you know i mean uh uh like I said, you know, did Charlie and Brian, as long as they've been here, you know, I'm already, you know, six years in myself, you know, whereas there's some bands. Uh, I mean, that was my thing, you know, that I, I credited, like when my time with Pat Travers was the fact of I juggled around and kept everybody happy that I, I could keep, you know, the four of us together for five years. That was the longest consistent lineup Pat ever had in his whole career. His stellar band of uh, uh, Mars Cowling, Tommy Aldridge, and Pat Thrall, that lineup was only together two and a half years. They made a lot of music and they made a lot of history in a short amount of time, but they were only together two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, it's just been a revolving door of people. You know, when you see a lot of bands like that, then to me, it's like, okay, you know, it's almost like then it kind of it waters it down. Um, but right now, you know, Charlie's got his fan base and he's consistently there. You know, Brian's got his fan base. He's consistently there. I know they really liked when I came in because, you know, the the youthfulness and and the people that followed me, you know, that, that you know, it, it brought a little breath of fresh air into it again. And uh, it's uh, like I said, consistency. It's just all about the consistency. And then in the meantime, you know. We are truly honored at what we do and what we represent. Now, I heard a rumor that uh, you plan on releasing a new studio record in uh, 2022. Is that correct? That would be about right. Yeah. Um, it was funny when the pandemic first hit. I'm like, going, well, it looks like we're fixing to have a bunch of time off when we get together and write songs. But Roger was stuck up in New York. Me, Charlie and Brian, we all live in Florida, but we're still scattered across Florida. Um, but, uh, it sounded like a novel ideal, but we sat in on it for a while, but about two months ago, Roger started talking about it more and more. And now that's kind of where we're starting to, you know, set our sights to, uh, um, you know, working on that along with once we start playing. So that means we'll start taking, you know, our time at sound checks and stuff, hashing out more and more ideals to, you know, start working on putting it together. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Ronnie, is there anything else you'd like to say to uh, the fans of rock music and Fog Hat fans before we uh, uh, end this interview? Hey, all I can say, I'm sure all of y'all is crazy like I am to get out there and enjoy live music and have a great time. It's coming back. It's something we definitely didn't see coming. I figured, hey, man, eh, maybe two, three weeks. And that turned into, what, 13, 14 months. <laughs> But uh, it's coming back and looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, check the foghat.com tour dates and, you know, come see us. Come say hey. hey. Foghat hits the road on July 17th is when your tour That's starts. First one out. Yes, sir. All right. Sounds good. Well, Rodney, thank you very much for your time and best of luck on the road. And uh, congratulations on an amazing live uh, record. Thank you. Thank you.